Hello, Monetization Nation. Welcome back to another episode with Kathleen Booth. In the last episode, we discussed how coupon extensions can erode our profit margins, how we can protect against coupon extensions, and how to use coupons effectively. In today's episode, we're going to discuss three of the biggest threats in cybersecurity and how to protect ourselves from them. We'll also discuss credibility marketing through influencers, recurring revenue streams that use emotional connections, and how HubSpot uses passion marketing. One tectonic shift we talk a lot about on this show is credibility marketing. We believe that's one of the biggest uh, tectonic shifts happening today, where in the past, people would, businesses would buy advertising and use that to tell the world how amazing they are, right? And that doesn't work very well anymore. And so businesses are having to turn to much, to different ways of marketing through much more credible sources like reviews marketing or, or testimonial success story marketing or influencer marketing. Can you share with us any stories or secrets or advice that, that you have of companies that have have used credibility marketing well? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I totally agree with that, by the way. I generally work in B2B marketing. And so um, I've always had a strong belief as a head of marketing that any company can have corporate marketing, but you need to invest in building up the personal brands of your executives. And that's just another type of influencer marketing. It's your internal influencer, right? Yeah. Like, so, uh, um, so going on podcasts like this, um, being on LinkedIn and, and being a thought leader and posting, you know, your perspective on things, um, you know, maybe having your own podcast or, or writing blogs, whatever it is, like having a personal brand and a point of view and being out there and not, you know, not being afraid to be honest, but also making sure you're authentic to who you are and to the vision of the company and the mission and the values is really important. So I would say that's number one. Like, I, I do think that there has been this renaissance of, of personal brand uh, marketing that has happened that is, is really powerful. Um, and you see that a lot in the emergence of these uh, paid newsletter platforms like Substack, where individual experts are, are starting to monetize their point of view through newsletters. It's fascinating. It's a great trend, but if it's not your internal influencers, then absolutely your external influencers. And I mean, even back when I ran my agency 10 years ago, we were doing influencer marketing, um, with a lot of success. And, but what I would say that's, that that's a very interesting development. That's going to further push this along is this move in the last year by, um, platforms, you know, like Apple, like Google to deprecate third-party cookies and because of that, in, in simple terms, what that means is you're not going to be able to do retargeting. You know, you're not going to be able to take the fact that somebody has visited your website and then feed them a Facebook ad because of that, you know, because Google isn't going to send that tracking information over to Facebook, nor is Apple. Um, and the world is increasingly moving in that direction. And marketers have, have used that as a crutch for a very long time. They've relied on it a lot. But so, so targeting is going to get harder. You know, Google isn't going to allow you to directly target people as much as it is kind of interest cohorts. It's called flock federated learning of cohorts. It's a horrible acronym, but <laughs> it just means you're targeting groups of people based on their interests and it's not a perfect science. And so what is more approaching a perfect science is targeting people through the people that they're following. And that's what influencer marketing is. You know, if you want to target, in my case, when I did it as an agency and we won an award for this, <clears throat> it was, we were trying to help a doctor sell more LASIK surgery. And, you know, you don't think of surgery as something that you'd necessarily use influencer marketing for because it's surgery, right? And it's eye surgery in this case. But, you know, that's a great example because here's something that people are not just going to buy eye surgery on an impulse, right? And it's, you're talking about letting somebody operate on your eyes. So there yeah. has to be a high degree of trust behind it. And yeah. so what we wound up doing was finding a, it was a Facebook influencer, a, a guy who used to be a, a weatherman for a TV station who left and went and became an online weatherman. He built up a huge following because he had a pretty local audience in the area where this doctor was based. And, and we got lucky because it just so happened that he didn't have perfect vision, had always thought about LASIK. We reached out to him and we said, you know, hey, this doctor would love to do free LASIK on you. Um, we're not going to pay you, but you'll get a free surgery as long as you're willing to talk about your experience. And we didn't say you have to rave about it. It was like, just be honest about whatever it was. And it happened that it was a very reputable doctor, which helped. But 
it was a match made in heaven. And the, to this day, I think it's like eight years later, they're still working together because he had a fantastic experience. He blogged about it. He did video blogs, like taking out his contacts for the last time. You know, he did one right before surgery. He did one right after surgery and his followers were blown away. Like the number of people that commented and said, I've always thought about this. And now if now seeing your great experience, I'm going to do it. And like the doc, mm. the doctor got a ton of new surgeries because of it, but it was because at the heart of everything as businesses, what we're selling is trust and it doesn't matter what your product is, right? Somebody has to trust you to buy from you. And so if you can find somebody else who already has established trust with the audience that you're trying to reach, there's like a halo effect where you can come in and, and that trust will be transferred to you because of that relationship you have with the influencer. And so it just like speeds up what otherwise could be a very long process of building that trust. I love it. And, and may not ever be able to do on your own without a credible source helping you. That's exactly right. Another tectonic shift we talk a lot about is recurring revenue streams. Seems like every major business is going from the one-time sale to that subscription or recurring revenue stream. Do you have any examples or advice about the recurring revenue stream? Yeah. So, you know, that obviously comes in many different shapes and forms. Um, you know, there's, there's consulting services and retainers and subscription based, you know, shipping, shipping of products. But the example I'm going to give is a little different and it's something that's accessible to any business, regardless of what you sell. So after I sold my agency, I spent two years at a company called impact. And that was another agency that had purchased my company. And, and what I focused on there was building a media company around the agency and this is something that you're starting to see now with a lot of businesses where there, there are a traditional business that might sell software or um, soda, Red Bull is a great example, or tractors, John Deere, or um, you know, financial products. Um, there's a company called Acorns. There's companies in almost every industry doing this where they've realized that, yes, they're going to sell their product, but what's even more powerful and going to make them more successful in the long term is to build a media brand around the business, build a community and monetize that. And that's really what publishers do is they build an audience first and they monetize that audience. And then they're able to introduce products and they have a ready-made audience waiting to buy. A great example of that is a couple of them, like Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow has done that. Chip and Joanna Gaines with Magnolia, you know, they built an audience and then they have product after product and new businesses that they start to sell to that same audience who's just there like baby birds waiting for the parent to feed them. I'll eat whatever you give me, right? And so the whole idea behind this is you, you build that big audience and, and there's an interesting nuance in what you asked, which is with recurring revenue, is it subscription? Yes, there's such a thing as subscription, but subscribers want to constantly get value. And if they don't constantly get it, they churn. So think about and the example I'll give you is your newspaper subscription. So I subscribed to the Washington Post when I used to live in DC. And when I stopped reading it, I stopped having time to read it. I canceled my subscription. By contrast, the membership model is a recurring revenue model, but it's not based on consistent value. It's based on wanting to be a part of something bigger than yourself, a feeling of belonging, a belief in a, in a mission or a vision. And members pay regularly, but don't churn as soon as they stop getting value because they're there more to be a part of the movement than they are to get value on a regular basis. Interesting. So, so the, the really great example here is the same one I already gave, which is the Washington Post. They made a shift in recent years and they introduced the tagline, democracy dies in darkness, which made them more mission oriented than they had been. And guess what? I resubscribed and I don't read it very often, <laughs> but I'm not churning because I believe in the mission. And that's just one example, but yeah. something to think about as a business when you're looking at recurring revenue is to give people something emotional to connect with and they'll be less likely to churn regardless of what it is you're receiving revenue for on a regular basis. So there's an ebook that I just wrote um, that, that we're just about to publish and it's called Passion Marketing. 
And the concept is you, you find the level 10 passion of your target audience, and then you market through that passion. And it sounds like Washington Post did that, you know, oh, absolutely. giving light to, to democracy. Um, can you think of any other examples of businesses that have effectively marketed through the highest level passions of their target audience? Oh, you know, I mean, I, one of the ones that I just think has been very successful is HubSpot, interestingly, and I'm choosing that de deliberately because it's B2B software, which most people would think is super boring. And how do people get passionate about B2B software? But I was a HubSpot agency partner for 11 years. And it, to this day, it astounds me how passionate people are in that community. Um, they talk about bleeding orange. They talk about drinking the orange Kool-Aid, like the language they use to describe being a part of that community is, is dramatic. Um, it's pretty unbelievable. And it's because they showed people a vision of what the world used to be like before what they, well, and they started out, it was inbound marketing and then of what the world could be like. And it was this, this transformation story that they told and is it, you know, is it the, the most exciting thing in the world? Perhaps not, but it got a lot of people really excited and it gave them something to really believe in that in the, the narrative they had was that the way marketing had always been done was broken and that there was a better way and a better future that was better for the marketer and better for the buyer. And that got a lot of people like really, really standing in line behind it, cheering. Um, and funny enough, they're also a company that has built a media business. They acquired the hustle which is a big newsletter because they're, they're building a media brand around their company, just like I described. Why should digital marketers care about cybersecurity? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question because I feel so passionately about this. Um, so there's a lot of data that shows that today marketers have bigger IT budgets than IT leaders do. And so if we are spending the bulk of the organization's IT money we darn well better understand how to protect that investment, as well as the fact that we own the company brand. And so being able to protect that brand, the user experience, these are all crucial, crucial things for marketers. Um, so, you know, understanding at least the basics about cybersecurity, which most marketers don't understand, it's not something we were ever taught we needed to know, um, is very important. You know, it runs everything from making sure your website won't get hacked to making sure that you're not compromising the personally identifiable information of your customers. It's so vital for marketers to develop some expertise in this area. What are the top security threats that uh, digital marketers need to be worried about? And what are the most important steps we need to take to, to secure our sites and businesses? Sure. So we already talked about the lightning strike risk, which is your website gets hacked and you know your company's computer system gets taken over by ransomware. Um, I, I think the very basic thing there is none, none of us as marketers will ever be true cybersecurity experts, right? Like we're never going to be in there writing the code that protects our companies. And so at, the, at a very basic level, make sure your company has somebody who is an expert in it that you can turn to for help to make sure that you're um, architecting your IT stack, your marketing stack in the, in the right way that it's secure, you know, whether that's an internal person who's your head of IT who understands this, or whether that's an outsourced uh, managed security services provider, that there are plenty of companies out there that specialize in doing this on, a, on an outsourced basis. Make sure that that's present and make sure that you're checking on the security aspects of the software that you're purchasing, especially as it integrates with the rest of your company systems. That's number one. Number two is when it comes to the website, understand all the different code that you are putting on it and that you're not putting on it, but is operating on it. And so this is an interesting area that was very eye-opening for me. Um, modern websites, this is when I go back to what I said in the beginning, you don't truly fully own it because the way modern websites are built, we allow, deliberately allow a lot of third-party code in, whether that is a plugin that we want to put on our site to add some functionality to it, whether that is a theme, like if we're building on WordPress, for example, and we, we purchase a the theme, that's third-party code, um, or whether it is a script, like a Facebook tracking pixel or Google Analytics script. Like we, we deliberately put this third-party code on our sites. And so you need to really understand whether you're getting that code from a trusted provider. And you also need to understand that it's not 
a one-time thing. You don't put it on and then forget it. You have to monitor. A great example of this is WordPress. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, there, there was a major announcement by the U.S. government that a particular WordPress theme, which had been sold by, I, I think it was Envato, one of the biggest marketplaces for themes, which is a trusted marketplace, yep. but not all the providers on Envato or necessarily have been the most well vetted. And one of the themes actually was built by a hacking group specifically to harvest PII from the websites where it was installed. So PII, personally identifiable information. Um, and basically it was on millions of sites around the world, all of them vulnerable. So that wasn't discovered until a year and a half ago. So you, you have to pay attention or you have to have somebody who's paying attention for you, which goes back to my first point of having an outsourced provider. So making sure that you understand that third-party code on your site is critical. And then the third thing, and this is an area that most marketers are really not good at, is what's called social engineering. So in cybersecurity terms, this just means um, being aware of the information that you're putting out into the world about yourself, your company, or the other people at the company, and how that makes you and others you work with vulnerable. Because people are the biggest point of vulnerability for any company when it comes to, to hacking. Um, very often it's, we let the attacker in and we don't even know it, whether that's through clicking on a bad link in a phishing email or some other way. And so the story I have here that I can share is social media posts. <clears throat> um, I was actually head of marketing for a cybersecurity company and our CEO and head of sales went to a conference in Georgia and they sent me a picture of themselves working the booth. And like any good head of marketing, I posted that picture to LinkedIn and I tagged them and I said, here's our CEO and our head of sales working the booth at this conference in Georgia. Um, you know, and it, it's what any marketer would think to do. Less than 15 minutes after I made this post, one of the newest employees at our company got an email from somebody. It was, and it looked like it was from our CEO saying, hey, I'm at this conference in Georgia. Could you please run out and get me $500 in gift cards? I really need it now. Send it to me this way, blah, blah, blah. And the guy did it. He, was, he hadn't worked at the company more than a week. So, so what happened here is somebody saw the post. They knew exactly who was in Georgia. They knew that it was Georgia. They knew the name of the conference. Then all they had to do was go to our LinkedIn company page and see who the most recent person to join the company was. Target that person with the email and all that specific information about the CEO. And they, that set up a situation that was, you know, very successful for them and that's social engineering. And so it's not that we shouldn't make these kinds of posts, but it's that we have to be aware of what that, what opening that creates for somebody who's willing to take advantage of it. And, and it speaks to things like, if you're going to post something like that as a marketer, put something in the company, all hands Slack channel saying, Hey, you know, the, the CEOs in Georgia don't, you know, it, first of all, as a policy, never go out and buy gift cards unless you've spoken over the phone with the CEO, <laughs> you know, like that's a policy we put in place afterwards, but like it's being aware of that kind of thing and, and having training for your team on how to recognize those attacks. So we had that exact same situation in our company happen. And um, one of my new employees was sent an email from me supposedly, and he ended up even going and I, he, I think he spent $1,500 on oh, wow. gift cards, spent it and sent them off and everything. And we, we lost it and they've tried to do the same hack on us several other times, but yeah, that's a very common. And marketers uh, create the opening. We open the door for it because we give out more information than any, any other part of the company does, more specific information with names and locations and things like that. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, if marketers are spending the bulk of the organization's IT money, they should understand how to protect that investment. Marketers also own the company brand, so they should be able to protect brand user experience. Number two, we should hire a cybersecurity expert that we can turn to with our cybersecurity questions and problems. Number three, we deliberately put third-party code on our sites. We should understand whether or not we're getting a code from a trusted provider. Number four, we need to be aware of how information we're putting into the world about ourselves, our company, or other people at the company makes us look vulnerable to social engineering. Number five, both internal and external influencers can be a great way to gain credibility. 
Number six, memberships and communities surrounding our brand can be a great way to set up recurring revenue streams. To learn more about or connect with Kathleen, you can find her on LinkedIn or visit her website at clean.io. And there's links to both of those sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free ebook about passion marketing and learn how to become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe to Monetization Nation on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in protecting your business from security threats. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.